Well, good morning and welcome to Oasis Church Online. My name is Daryl. We are so glad that you're tuning in with us today. Uh, in just a minute, you're going to hear me make an announcement about an event coming up. It's our night of worship happening November 16th. And I just wanted to give you a heads up that uh, this event will also be streamed live online and it will be available on our YouTube channel uh, afterwards. So if you can't make it in person, you don't have to miss out. Well, our service is about to begin, so I'll see you back here in about one minute. Well, good morning and welcome to Oasis Church. My name is Daryl. I'm one of the pastors here and uh, welcome to everyone tuning in online. Welcome to those of you here in the building. Hey, if you're wondering what to expect today, we're going to be here for around one hour. And uh, if you see people wandering around in costumes around the building, uh, that's because over in the kids environment, we are celebrating our mega awesome costume party. And uh, so as a side note, we do have a photo opportunity for that um, with backdrop and everything. So parents, if you're interested, uh, it's outside uh, by the courtyard, just uh, by the, the parking lot. And uh, here in the auditorium, our plan is to sing some songs. We're celebrating baptism today with two people, one in each service. And uh, we are in our teaching series called Reason to Believe. And uh, we're in week three today uh, with our lead pastor, Dustin Funk. Um, but before we get into that, I wanna let you know about three things. Uh, we have a night of worship coming up. It's November 16th at uh, 7.30 p.m. Uh, with dessert at the end. And uh, so come on out, invite your friends. Everyone is welcome to come. And uh, as for the living room, it won't be a regular night, uh, but young adults are welcome to uh, hang out over on the east side with dessert. Uh, like a normal Thursday night. Speaking of the living room, we have an event coming up. We are uh, going to Camp Cedarwood for a retreat January 5th to the 7th, and uh, just a great chance to get the year started off right. Uh, spending time with God, spending time with other young adults, it's gonna be a really fun weekend. Uh, space is limited, but there are still some spots available, so if you want more information or to register, uh, you can check the Oasis website. I uh, click the link in our Instagram bio, the living room underscore Oasis, or just scan the QR code uh, right in front of you, and that will take you there as well. Third thing to let you know about, uh, something that will impact all of us um, because it addresses the traffic flow as we leave the service. You may have noticed we've got lots of people coming on Sundays, uh, which is awesome, uh, but also can create some congestion. Also with Wilkes traffic being uh, busier than ever before. Also there's a train uh, you may have noticed. Uh, and so what we would ask, if at all possible, if there's a lineup uh, and you're sitting backed up in the, the parking lot, if you could take a left turn. I got a little map here I drew up uh, this morning. Um, no, I, I didn't do it. But uh, if you take a left onto Elmhurst Road, you're just a couple more lefts away from being on uh, Wilkes uh, via Fairmont, or you can go to Grant uh, and get to Keniston, depending on which way you're going. Again, if it's backed up, if at all possible, this would uh, help us out. Obviously, that would take you a couple more minutes to get to Wilkes, but may save you that many minutes and more of not sitting in the parking lot. Uh, so once again, if you're able, that would really help us out. 
Well, we're gonna get going by uh, singing some songs together. And uh, this first song we're gonna sing is a song we taught you a few weeks ago that just talks about uh, praising God no matter what's going on in our lives. And you know, sometimes when we just switch our focus off of uh, the things that are stressing us out and put our focus on our God who's so much bigger than all of that, who's dependable, who's trustworthy, uh, it just makes our worries get a little bit smaller. And so we wanna invite you to, to stand if you're able and join uh, Avery, Jake, Lauren, and Chanson as we sing together. Good morning, everybody.
song and worship you if it puts me in the fire i'll rejoice because you're there too i won't be for my feelings i'll hold fast to what is true if the cross brings transformation then i'll be crucified with you because death is just the doorway Hey, I'm Josh, and this is my story. I went to a Christian school from preschool until I graduated and was brought up in a Christian home. Veggie Tales was always on as a kid. Now, because of this, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior at a very young age. I don't think I could even read yet, but I could already recite a dozen Bible verses and the entire Christmas story. It wasn't until sometime in high school that my faith became my own and not just something I had grown up with. Thankfully, I had some great mentors that showed me what it meant to be a man of God and how to live out my faith. It was around this time that I started coming to Oasis, and very quickly I started volunteering in Upstreet as one of the worship leaders. I absolutely love getting up on stage and jumping around and praising Jesus with all the kids up there. Before long, I really started to feel like I belonged to this community of people. I even began to feel God calling me to consider that maybe he could use me to touch the hearts and minds of others, that he could use me for something bigger than myself. Unfortunately, with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, life became a little rocky. I was still trying to volunteer where I could online, but it just wasn't the same as being on stage with the kids. Things were starting to blow up in my personal life too and with lots of uncertainties all around me, I was starting to feel farther and farther away from that calling and from Jesus himself. My anxiety got the better of me, and for a while I stopped coming to church completely. I felt like Jesus wasn't with me anymore, and if that was true, why should I bother? And then, a couple years ago, I met this incredibly brave kid named Ethan. He was fighting leukemia, and his dream was to meet Spider-Man, which, through my job entertaining at kids' parties, I was lucky enough to be able to fulfill for him. I had the amazing opportunity to meet him and his family, and to be a part of something bigger than myself. I got to help create the special dream come true moment for Ethan, and God used Ethan's story to change my life forever. Ethan reminded me of that calling from God on my life, and his courage in the face of illness reminded me of my favorite Bible verse. Joshua 1 verse 9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. If this brave little kid could keep on fighting despite uncertainties going on in his life, I knew I could as well. 
I know that Ethan is in heaven, where one day we'll meet again. A couple months ago, I started coming back to Oasis and volunteering in Upstreet on Sundays, as well as attending the Young Adults Environment, The Living Room, on Thursday nights. There, I joined a small group and instantly felt like I belonged. We laugh, we cry, we joke around, and share in deep, meaningful conversations that have strengthened my relationship with Jesus to a point it's never been before. Sure, there are still uncertainties and anxieties in my life, but I am confident that Jesus will be with me through it all. And that's why I'm here today, to publicly declare my love for Jesus Christ through baptism. Amazing, amazing. Well, here baptizing Josh is uh, one of his life group leaders at the living room, Adam. And Josh, thank you so much for sharing your story. And uh, you, you said it best, uh, uncertainties and anxieties may be part of life, but uh, we can all cling to that, that promise in Joshua that we can be strong, we can be courageous because God's going to be with us wherever we go. And that's the kind of promise and the kind of person uh, worthy of putting our trust in and putting our faith in. And it's based on that faith that you have placed in him that we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. join us. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation,
Jesus, thank you for the words of that song and the songs we've been singing today that remind us, in spite of uncertainty, all the stresses and worries of life, that we have reason to praise you all day long, that your presence is with us. As we heard in, in Josh's story, we thank you for, for his story and his, his decision to be baptized today and his words uh, reminding us of your promise that we can be strong, we can be courageous because you are with us everywhere that we go. We thank you for that. We praise you for that. Amen. You can have a seat. And again, uh, so exciting to be able to celebrate baptism with Josh today. And you know, uh, when we hear stories like that, when we see baptisms, really that, that is a picture of what the, this church is all about, seeing lives transformed by the message of Jesus. We believe that uh, when that message, when, when that hope sinks into our lives, it changes everything. And, uh, and, and if you have, um, if you've seen this happen in your life and you've made the decision to follow Jesus, um, choosing to be baptized is a way of publicly declaring your faith. And it's also uh, something that's commanded of all people who follow Jesus. And so if you're interested in learning more about baptism, uh, email us at info at oasischurch.ca. And, you know, I, I just want to remind you as well that, um, you know, if you give to support uh, this, this church, uh, when you hear baptism story, uh, you are a part of that. You are a part of every single story of life change that happens at Oasis, the stories you hear and the stories that you don't hear. And so be reminded of that as you give today. And if you're a guest here today or this is one of your first times with us, don't feel like you need to participate in this part of our service. Um, but for those who call Oasis home, uh, we want to give a few moments for those who want to do their giving now. And thanks again. Nothing, just cleaning up a little. Well, hey, we've been in this series where we've been saying, um, let's look at some of these tough questions that we face in our world, in our society, and we've been looking at great answers so that hopefully you can keep believing in the sentiment of that song all through your life, that the Bible really is trustworthy. And so we've been looking at some tough questions and tough messages that get presented to us in our culture, and we've been saying that one of the goals of this series is to present that Christianity is respectable, 
It is desirable and believable. And we've really been trying to hit this word here, desirable. It's just say, even if you're here and you don't believe what we're looking at or don't believe this truth, you're looking at this and hopefully we're showing how attractive Christianity is to make sense of our world that you'd say, man, I hope that's true. Even if I don't believe that, I hope that's true because the message of Jesus really gives us unequaled resources to deal with some of the challenges of our present, uh, present day and age. And this is so important because we are being taught a belief system and we're being taught ideas in regards to so many areas every day of our life. This happens in media. This happens uh, in so many forms of uh, messaging coming towards us. Uh, we're being taught a message regarding all these areas. Next week, we're going to look at freedom. And one of the messages that comes to us is, hey, you should be free to do whatever you want to do in life, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. And, and I'm going to ask, does that work? Where, where does that lead us? Is there a better way? And the messaging regarding so many of these areas are presented to us as, just as givens. Everybody knows that this is true, right? About freedom or whatever. And uh, my suggestion is that Christianity actually has better resources for you. It has better resources. And we've been going through a book. Um, almost all my thoughts come from a book and supporting resources um, by a guy named Tim Keller. It's for sale at the bookstore called Making Sense of God. And these resources have been so helpful to me. I can't take any credit. I just feel like it's my job as pastor to pass them on to you to help make sense of our world. And so each of these weeks, week one, if you were here, um, was all about identity. We said, if you, you really you can't live without an identity that's solid enough to handle the ups and downs of your performance. And Christianity gives you that. Uh, then last week, we looked at meaning in life. And you need purpose or significance in life that, that's able to face suffering. All of us are going to suffer in some way, shape, or form. Probably multiple ways of, of suffering. And the ways we're told to construct purpose in our life, they, they disintegrate when we face suffering. And so... Christianity gives us another way. Um, next week, as I said, we're going to look at some way of determining right and wrong. It's more than just selfishness. The final week of the series, we're going to look at hope and hope for the future. And what we've been doing each of these weeks has kind of been comparing belief systems and saying, uh, can you live these, this way? Like, this is what we're taught by our society, but can you actually live this way or do you have to smuggle in beliefs from other systems? And today what I want to look at is you can't live without happiness or satisfaction that can sustain you through the changing circumstances in life. And so let me ask you this. Have you learned in our world, in our modern world, have you learned how to be happy and how to become and stay happy? Don't think that's a trivial question. Sometimes we talk about that and people say, well, that's, that's, such a, that's beneath me somehow. And I think if we honestly look at our lives, just about everything we're doing is in some way a pursuit of happiness. It's a pursuit of fulfillment and contentment and satisfaction. And here's the main message we get uh, told to us in various forms in our society is that you don't need God to be happy. You don't need God to live a life full of satisfaction and happiness. And so I just want to ask today, does that work? Is it working? Is it working for you? Is it working for us as a society? There is so much data now that says we are modern secular society, the Western world. Um, we are unhappier. We are doing worse when it comes to happiness and satisfaction than any other culture. I don't mean just any other culture now. I mean any other culture in history. In Canada, there's such a lack of satisfaction that social scientists have always said that one of the barometers of the mental health and the health of a society is obviously the suicide rate. In Canada, 4,000 people, unfortunately, this is terrible, 4,000 people each year commit suicide. For every one person that commits suicide, 10 people try. It's this epidemic. And, and, and there's so much data, you can look into this about happiness levels, um, but there's so much data to say, I think it's pretty self-evident. We as a society are not doing well in this area. We're not happy. We're not finding satisfaction in life. And while it's worse than it's ever been, I think there's something that's, that's very clear to say that this is not a new problem. Humans have been facing this for a long time. There's a Roman poet named Horace a few thousand years ago who said this, no one lives content. No one lives content. And, and I think one of the challenges that uh, I have to communicate how good the message of Christianity is, is sometimes we live in denial about the depth of our discontent. And it's hard for us to admit, especially when you're young. Sometimes we don't realize the depth of our discontent. There's a playwright named Wallace Stevens, and he said, even in contentment, even when I'm doing okay, I still feel the need for some imperishable bliss. There's, I'm still not happy. And I think all of us can relate. And, and, and if we're honest, if we look into our hearts and souls, we would say that our desires are much deeper than we think. Our desires are deeper. The hunger inside of us is huge. The, the hole we have, how much we want, how much we're looking for to be happy. Years and years ago, uh, there were, I've shared this quote with you a number of times. There's a writer named Cynthia Heimel, and she wrote for the Village Voice, which is this, this little... Um, 
newspaper in New York City, and she said this. She said, I pity celebrities. And she actually named a few celebrities that you would know. I'm not going to be cruel for me to put their names in here, but she named some people that she worked with when she worked at Macy's in New York City and at a nightclub with another guy. And they said they were once perfectly pleasant human beings, but now, now that they've become famous, now that they've become supreme beings, their wrath is awful. When God wants to play a really rotten practical joke on you, he grants you your deepest wish. He gives you the thing that you said, you know, if I could just have this, I'd be happy. And then he giggles when you suddenly realize you want to kill yourself. Not sure about her theology, but um, okay. She's saying these celebrities, okay, these people that I knew, were they wanted fame. You know, they thought this is it. They worked, they pushed. The morning after each of them became famous, they wanted to take an overdose because the giant thing they were striving for the fame that was going to make everything okay, make their lives bearable, provide them with personal fulfillment and happiness, had happened. They got it. And they were still them. And the disillusionment turned them howling and unsufferable. They got the thing they said, this is going to make me happy, and it didn't. Now here's the thing. Most of us um, never break through, right? And so it's possible to live in the illusion. Most of us, you know, I, I didn't make the NHL, or, you know, you didn't become a billionaire, or you didn't become an actress or actor. And so many of us can live in the illusion. If only, you know, if only I would have got that, then I would have been happy. And these celebrities have it all. And she's saying it didn't bear the weight of their soul. It didn't bear the weight of their soul. There's a music producer named Rick Rubin who's worked with Jay-Z and Adele and Johnny Cash and Beastie Boy, really, who's who. And he says it like this. He says, it's hard to get really depressed until your dreams actually come true. Like, I've got everything I want, and I realize it's not enough. What what does this tell us? Your desires, the desire, if you honestly knew how to look into your own heart and soul, I think you'd say that your desires are deeper than you think. The hunger inside of us is huge. One author that we've been looking at a lot in the series, a guy named C.S. Lewis, wrote about this so insightfully, and he's this incredible insight into how even the best things in life leave us wanting. He says this, most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promise. The longings which arise in us when we first fall in love, or first think of some foreign country, or first take up some subject that excites us, are longings which no marriage, no travel, no learning can really satisfy. And then look what he says here. He says, I'm not, I'm not now speaking of what would ordinarily be called unsuccessful marriages. Or I'm not talking about you know, bad holidays or careers that really didn't turn out. I'm speaking of the best possible ones. There was something we grasped at in that first moment of longing that just fades away in the reality. I think everyone knows what I mean. The wife may have been a good wife. Your husband may have been great. And the hotels and scenery may have been excellent. And chemistry may have been an interesting job, but something, it, evades us. Something has evaded us. What's he saying? Your desires are deeper than you think. All of us have this insatiable, this unquenchable problem where our desires are deep. We want more than what this world offers. And so what do we do with that? He goes on in his writing, C.S. Lewis, to say there's a number of ways that people deal with this. Some people say it, that thing that's going to make me happy, it is still out there. And it's different for everyone. For someone, it's fame. For someone, it's money. For someone, it's family. For some people, it's sex. For some people, it's power, right? And so there's two forms of this. Um, some people say it's still out there, but I, you know, I just haven't got it yet. Uh, I'm still young. And so one day, well, you know, when I actually have a family, then I'll be happy. Or one day when I make more money, I'll be happy. Or he says the other form of this is sometimes people um, never achieve it, and they end up quite bitter. And they say, if only if I could have you know, made that you know, team, or if I could have had that job, then I would have been happy. But they both say, it's still out there. There is happiness to be found. But the other response that he talks about in his writings on this, and he says, people got the thing that they wanted, the thing that the it that they thought would make them happy, and they, be, they played in the NFL, or they became a published author, or they married that guy or whatever, and they didn't find it. They didn't find happiness. And there's a number of different responses to this. Um, one response is that he talks about some people who just say, you know what my problem is? I just got the wrong set. And so they keep going through life exchanging. And my wife didn't make me happy, so you know what? I think I need a better wife or a different wife. And money didn't make me happy. I think I need more money. That's the problem. And he calls these people the fools because they keep going through life exchanging. And there's other people who got it, and it didn't make them happy. 
they give over to despair. And this is what sometimes leads to suicide or cutting or things like that. But then he says another response that's quite common is if you get the thing, you got the thing that was going to make you happy. What happens is often if it doesn't actually do it, if it doesn't make you happy, you begin to harden yourself. And, and what you say is, you know, there really is no happiness in this life. Our deepest desires, they're actually illusions. And C.S. Lewis calls these people the disillusioned, sensible person. And he describes them like this. This is how their um, self-talk sounds. Maybe you've heard someone talk like this. Maybe you've talked like this. They say, of course, one feels like that when one's young. But by the time you get to my age, you've given up chasing the rainbow's end. And so this person settles down and learns not to expect too much out of life. And they uh, repress the part of themselves which used to, as they would say, cry for the moon. And so basically you just say, ah, you're never going to be happy. I'm never going to be happy. And, and two things happen. He talks about it. He says, one, you kind of sometimes become a remarkable snob. And you look down at people who think that there is happiness in life. But the other thing is you actually harden yourself. You actually hurt yourself quite badly. And you're hurting the part of you that makes you human. If any of you have read a lot of Martin Heidegger, I, I had a professor at U of M who was really into him, and I had to read a lot of his stuff. And he said, the thing that makes humans different from animals is that animals are quite content to just exist, and humans never are. And when you kill that thing that says, it's out there, happiness can be found, he says, y you're hardening yourself. You're, you're, you're making yourself, you're killing that part of you that makes you human, and, and you're really becoming more animal-like. What is this all saying? Your desires are deeper than you think. They're deeper. Than, I think if we honestly look into our own hearts and souls, we see that, right? They're bigger. So what's the solution? Is there a solution? I'd like you to consider the um, name of uh, a, a guy, the life and teachings of a guy named Augustine or Augustine, Augustine. And maybe your church tradition called him Saint Augustine or Augustine of Hippo. He's one of the greatest thinkers in human history. Definitely one of the greatest thinkers in the history of the church. And he was born and raised in Africa. So he's part of this marginal uh, part of the world. He's kind of a marginal people group. He's part of the Berber people group, likely. And just like this, he's kind of on the outskirts of society. But he longed to be on the insides because he was brilliant. And so he longed to go to the big city. He longed to be educated. He wanted to be admitted into the circles of the elite and the intellectual. And he actually also wanted to have a lot of sex, is what he said. So he said, you know what? I'm going to move to Carthage, which was like the most cosmopolitan city in Africa at the time. And he did. And he actually got educated, and he was part of the intellectual world there, and he became part of uh, the elite society there, and he was sexually active. But he said, I'm very unhappy. Like, I'm still, I'm getting all these things, but... I'm just unfulfilled and, and I'm unsatisfied. And he decided, you know what my problem is? The problem is, is that Carthage is like a real backwater town. This is like outskirts and small. So he said, I gotta get to Rome. So he gets to Rome. And even though he's there and he's moving up and he's meeting more people and, and he's becoming more influential and he's kind of becoming on the inside, he still said, you know, I have this. I'm getting these things, but I'm like empty. I'm still, I'm still not content. And so finally he's, he found a way to get to Milan. And Milan at that time was the center of the Roman Empire, that's where the emperor lived. And, and Augustine actually began to work with the imperial administration. And he was reaching the top. And he says to himself, this is it, I've reached the top. But he was very honest, he was looking to his own heart and soul and he said, you know, it's still not enough. And he began to experience disenchantment and disillusion. And he's like, man, like I'm, I'm getting everything I always wanted and there's like nothing here, it's like vapor. And so he started getting into philosophy, and the dominant philosophy at the time in Roman philosophy was a guy named Cicero who said, you're never going to be happy. Like, sex isn't going to do it. Money's not going to do it. Intellectual uh, achievement and writing books isn't going to do it. And we don't have time to go into all the details of Augustine's life, but eventually, through thinking about this in philosophy, it actually led him to Christianity, and it led him to Jesus. And in his, in his book, um, Confessions, as he was kind of sharing his life story, and you can read about it, all his journeys, um, there's actually two very famous quotes where he talks about this search. And he says this. First, he said, My sin, my mistake, I realized, consisted in this, that I sought pleasure. I was looking for fulfillment and happiness, not in God, but in what God had made, in creation, in myself, and other created beings. And he said, I'm going about this all wrong. I'm, I'm looking into the wrong things. And then another point, he says this very, very famous quote. He says, To worship you, worship you, God, that's the deepest desire of humanity. For you have made us for yourself, 
and our heart is restless until it finds rest and fulfillment in you. If you hear nothing else, hear this one line from Augustine who said, our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. And people all over the world for thousands of years have testified that this is true, that there is nothing that can satisfy. And the revolutionary thing that Augustine saw and put into words so well is that it is out there. There is something that can satisfy, that the deepest desires of my heart, there is something that can satisfy, but the deepest need of your heart and my heart is to be loved by God and to love him. That that is what you've been made for. And he says, until you get that straight, until that becomes number one, you are going to be restless because there's this emptiness, there's this cavity. And some of you know exactly what he's talking about because you've been successful enough to put train loads and car loads of success into this space inside of you, right? And then you've realized this, I've put all this, I thought if I could marry them or if I could have that much money, I would be happy. And it kind of feels like the space inside me is as big as outer space. It's like as big as the universe. And I keep putting stuff in here and it's empty and it's empty. And you wonder, how could this space be so big? It's God-sized. The only thing that can fill that is God. And the way, the way we go about it, it's all wrong. We're trying to put things that he's created into his spot, and he'll never fill it up. Another way to talk about what, this is the way Augustine talked about it, is he's talked about our main problem as humans is disordered loves. It's not that money or uh, family or friends or sex or a career are bad. But the problem is, is that we look at all these things and, and we don't order them right in our hearts. And so we take good things, like a friendship, and we make them into ultimate things. And we try to say, make me happy. You know, we look to a career, we look to money and say, this is it. It's going to fill me up. And it never can. Because it's not an ultimate thing. It's a created thing. It's a good thing. For ex- one of the best, I'll give you two examples of this. One, uh, in my marriage, marriage is a good thing. But if I look to my wife to make me happy, and I often do, I have to catch myself, right? If I look, look to her, I, 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 I'll ruin my marriage, right? If I don't love God more than I love Lauren, I, I, our marriage doesn't go well because I crush her with expectations and I can't hear her criticism and her correction and I put too much value on her opinions. It's only if I love God more than I love my wife that all of a sudden I, I, I can stop trying to make Lauren do for me what only God can do for my heart and soul. And when I love God first and I order my loves properly, all of a sudden I love Lauren better because I don't look to her to do the things that only God can do. It's an example of ordering our loves. Another great example of this um, Tim Keller, who, um, whose resources I'm using for this series, he passed away earlier this year. Uh, but before he passed, he wrote an incredible article that you can look up when you get home in the Atlantic. It's called Growing My Faith in the Face of Death. And he had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And uh, he wrote this incredible article just saying, hey, I've counseled people all my life. Uh, can I take my own advice? Is it working? And he talked about how... Um, uh, Well, let me just read it to you instead of saying what he said. He says this. As this reality grows, my likely death grows, what are the effects on me now? What are the effects on how I live? This is his testimony. He's a man, you know, he's going to die soon. He says, one of the most difficult results to explain is what has happened to my joys, what's happened to my happiness. Since my diagnosis, my wife and I have come to see that the more we tried to make heaven out of this world, the more we grounded our comfort and security in this world, the less we were able to actually enjoy it. And, and he gives a great example of how um, sometimes when they go on vacation, I, 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 um, I, I identify with this, where he, his wife would grieve because as soon as she arrives at a beautiful place, she'd kind of have this longing that, oh, i got to leave one day, and you kind of want to get too much out of it, right? And, and so he says this. He said, Kathy and I should have known better. We did know better. When we turn good things into ultimate things, we ne- they necessarily disappoint us. But to our surprise and encouragement, it's only as I've become, for lack of a better term, more heavenly minded, more heavenly minded, more focused on God, that I can see the material world for the astonishingly good divine gift that it is. And he says, I can sincerely say, without any exaggeration, that I've never been happier in my life. That my days have been more filled with comfort. This is a man facing his imminent death, and he said this. This is this is the quote, don't miss this. He says, the less. We attempt to make this world into a heaven. That's disordered loves, right? The less we try to make this the thing that's going to make me happy, the more we're actually able to enjoy these things. We're no longer burdening it with demands impossible for it to fulfill. We have found that the simplest things 
from sun on the water and flowers in the vase to our own embraces bring more joy than ever. This has taken us by surprise. It's an example of ordering our loves. When we look too much into the things of this world, they don't even really bring us joy because you're putting too much on it. But when you realize our hope and our life is in God, it, these things can be what they are, good things, right? The way this shows up, how to seek happiness, the way it shows up, and it's easy to miss, the way it shows up over and over again in the Bible is like this. Let me give you one example of this. This is from Psalm chapter 1. And Psalm 1 is kind of like the gateway to all the Psalms. Some Old Testament theologians say it's actually the gateway to the entire Bible. Here's how to understand the Bible. It says blessed, and this word can also be translated happy. Happy or fortunate or satisfied. Blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take. It's talking about the paths we walk in in life. Or sit in the company of mockers. But it says blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. It's telling us, here's the way. You want to be happy? Here's the way to do it. And the first thing that's amazing that this psalm says is, one, happiness, again, it is possible. It is out there. But it's over and over saying to us that happiness can never be found directly. If your goal is to be happy, you will never get there. Happiness is always a byproduct. You get happy by seeking something more than happiness. You will never, this is another way to say it, to be happy You have to search for something higher than just happiness. The Bible never says, happy is the person who seeks happiness. Blessed is the person who seeks blessedness. It never works like that. It says this, you're blessed when your delight is in the law of the Lord. This is how the prophet Jeremiah said it, very, very similar. It says, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in them. The Bible never says, happy is the one who seeks happiness. No, it says, you gotta put God first. Happy is the one who seeks God, who trusts in God. To be happy, you have to search for something higher than happiness. That's the path. That's the only path, because your desires are too big. If you put something else in there, it'll never fill it. Now, you may push back on that. You might say, okay, Dustin, like, okay, I'm, I, I admit I'm not happy, but you're saying, okay, to be happy, all I gotta do is love God. Like, okay, how does that work? Because I'm trying, right? And here is where Christianity has an incredible advantage over all other worldviews, over all over other religions. Because I can describe God to you, right? And I can say, oh, God's kind of like this, and he, he creates, and he, you know, he's kind of like, but is that gonna make you love, right? I don't know. That's, it's very hard to love an abstract concept like that. And the Christian advantage is this, is that God has come to earth in Jesus Christ. He has lived among us. We can read about what God is like. We have these incredible accounts in the New Testament that tell us, here is what God was like when he was among us. He lived. He died. He went to the cross. He, he was risen again. He saved us at infinite cost. And it says, this is the God we love. This is the God that will make us happy. This is the God we can trust. He first loved us. It's totally different. To illustrate this, um, there's a story, and and, uh, this is a fictional story, but it gives you a picture of what I'm talking about. It's a story of a king or a czar in Russia uh, before the communist revolution. And this king had a friend who, uh, his friend was dying, and he came to the czar, his friend came to the king and said, I'm not going to live much longer. Would you please raise my son? He's eight years old. My wife is dead. Would you please raise him? And this this czar says, you know, we've been friends for a long time. Yes, I'll I'll do that. And he adopts this boy, and he raises him as his own, and he loves him, and he gives him a great life, and he gives him a great education, and he grows up. And this adopted son uh, decides to go into the army. And after a while, he becomes a higher rank in the army, and he becomes an administrator of a certain branch of the military, but he gets into gambling, and he keeps it a secret, but over time, the gambling debts start to accrue, and they accrue, and so he starts to embezzle army funds to make good on his debts, but it's getting worse, and it's getting worse, and the debts keep growing, and and one night, um, as it's getting worse and worse, he looks at the books, and he realizes the jig is up, like, there's there's no way. I'm going to be found out. There's no way out, and he says, the shame and dishonor is too much for me. I'm going to kill myself, and so he gets out a revolver, but He also needs to get his nerve up. So he gets out some alcohol to drink, but he drinks too much, and he passes out. 
And the czar, kind of like in um, different, I think it was in Henry V, right, in Shakespeare, this czar, this king, would get dressed up in plain clothes. He would dress up like an enlisted man in the army and just go and walk amongst his troops to see what the morale was like and see how, how the army was doing. And so the czar went out in disguise this night, and he was moving about the camp, and he goes into the tent of his adopted son, and he sees everything. He sees the gun, he sees the alcohol, he sees the sun passed out, and he sees the open books, and he realizes everything that has happened. And when the young man wakes up the next morning or in the middle of the night, whenever it was, he sees a note there, and it's from the czar, and it says, I, the czar, will make good on this debt from my own personal wealth, and it's stamped with his insignia. And this man wakes up and he sees, says, the king, the czar, has seen everything, and he knows what I've done, and he still loves me. And not only that, but he's saving me at incredible cost to himself. That's what the king is doing for me. And that's basically the Christian gospel. That is the message of Christianity, that God created us, and we owe him everything. But we have turned away. We have gone, we have sinned and done our own thing. And now God has come down. He's come among us in the person of Jesus Christ. He's died for us. He's died for us in the form of Jesus Christ on the cross. And he's looked into our lives and he's seen everything. He knows what we've done and yet he still loved us and saved us at infinite cost to himself. He has paid the debt. And when you dwell on that, when you see what he has done for you, and you see how precious we must be to him, that makes him precious to us. It's the awakening of love. And it starts to do something in our hearts. And love begins to grow. And the Bible says that's the path to a happy life. Happy are those whose God is the Lord. You're not gonna find it anywhere else. Your heart is gonna be restless until it finds rest in God. Jesus made this incredible claim about himself. He said this, that I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. If you have ever done a low-carb diet, right? <laughs> if you've ever tried keto, you know exactly what he's saying. Because it doesn't matter how much green stuff you eat, I'm still hungry, right? <laughs> and our souls are kind of like that, right? Never satisfied. You can put truckloads of stuff and say, I want more. I'm still hungry. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I'm the one who fills the hunger. Nothing else is gonna do it. I satisfy. And in a moment, I'm gonna say a prayer. If you wanna begin a relationship with this bread of life, Jesus, the one who fills things up, then I encourage you to pray long. And maybe this is your day when you take a step across that line and say, this is what I need. This is what I need in my life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, what an incredible, incredible idea that you have looked into our lives and you know us, you know all the worst about us, and yet you still love us. You still give us acceptance and you still went to the cross. To be known and loved is unbelievable. So we thank you for that. We thank you for the cross. Maybe if you're here today and you'd say, I want to know this, Jesus. I want to know this bread of life. You'd say a prayer and you'd say, Jesus, as best as I know how, I want to trust you as a savior and follow you as a leader. I ask you to come into my heart and life. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you for accepting me into your family. God, for all of us, would you forgive us of the ways in which we try to fill this longing in, in, in without you? We're, we're all guilty of it, whether it's through fame or beauty or power or, or riches. Help us to realize that you're better. You're better than all these things. For people here today that are walking wrong paths, would you help them to see that? Help us not to waste another day of our lives looking into things that just pale in comparison to your beauty and to your feeling power in our lives to give us joy and meaning and satisfaction. Amen.
these things The prettiest face to turn their eyes Beauty that could hypnotize The open doors that looks at me You are better than all these things Your love is better than you back next week for part four of the series go in the great hope that is ours as followers the risen Jesus Christ thanks everyone
Thunder 